of our Peacemaking from Bottom to Top series, investigating the future of peacemaking from the grassroots to the policy level in 2021. My name is David Catabaugh. I'm on the TELOS team here in Washington, DC. We are so glad you are joining us and I'd invite you to introduce yourself and where you're joining from in the chat below. For those of you who are joining us at a TELOS event for the first time, the TELOS group is an American nonprofit whose mission is to form communities of peacemakers across lines of difference and equip them to help reconcile seemingly intractable conflict at home and abroad. Today, we're diving into the weeds to hear firsthand from Hands of Peace, an organization working on the ground at the grassroots level, creating the kind of necessary space for a dialogue, collaboration, and action across lines of difference that promotes and sustains lasting political agreements. Through immersive dialogue-based programs in the US, Hands of Peace empowers American, Israeli, and Palestinian youth to become agents of change. We'll discuss the unique challenges and opportunities of this work and hear more about the lasting impact of people-to-people -people exchanges. We're honored to be joined by Hands of Peace Executive Director Scott Rasmussen and two alumni of the program, Stav Arnon and Elias Hoila, as they share more about the work of Hands of Peace and their personal experiences. Before we get started, just a quick note, we'll spend the first part of the call in moderated discussion, followed by Q&A. As you have questions, please write them in the chat and, or send them directly to my colleague, Sharon Heck. Um, and we will give uh, you an opportunity to ask your questions during our Q&A directly to the speakers. We've scheduled an hour for the call, though if you have a lot of questions, our speakers have agreed to stay an extra 15 minutes for you all. So let's get started. Stav, Scott, and Elias, would you each briefly introduce yourself, tell us where you're calling in from, um, starting with you, Scott. Sure, David, thanks. My name is uh, Scott Rasmussen, and, and as David said, I'm the Executive Director for Hands of Peace. I am located in Spokane, Washington. I uh, have been with Hands of Peace for about four months, and prior to that, I served as a U.S. diplomat in the Foreign Service, most recently in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm Elias Hawila. I'm uh, 32 years old. Uh, I'm an MD PhD, uh, currently uh, uh, in the middle of my residency in uh, family medicine in Tel Aviv. Uh, I'm a Palestinian, born and raised in Haifa, and uh, an alumni of Hands of Peace uh, from 2004. And hello, everyone. I am uh, Stav, also an alumni from uh, 2004 with Elias. And uh, this is very emotional for me because uh, my host family is here with us. So I'm very, very excited. Uh, I'm 31 years old, also living in Tel Aviv, Israel. I'm a social worker, and now I'm studying my MA in political science in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I'm an activist initiated with my friend and led uh, the first and largest women's strike in Israel and the first women's march. Great. We have an excellent panel here today. I'm excited to jump in. So let's get started. Scott, I'd love to start with you. Um, can you tell us more about the work of Hands of Peace, what you all do? Um, and also, could you unpack a little bit more about what we mean when we talk about grassroots peacemaking? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, David. And thanks again. It's really exciting to see us, the Hands of Peace community and TELUS communities coming together. Um, so just as a background, a little bit on Hands of Peace, we're an interfaith organization that empowers uh, American, Israeli, and Palestinian youth to become agents of change. Um, so our, our founder is Gretchen Grad. She's from Chicago. She's on the call today. She had the inspiration for Hands of Peace uh, come to her one night as she pondered the, the cultural and religious divisions she, she saw in her community and in the Middle East uh, after 9-11. So Gretchen got together with some friends from her church, uh, a local synagogue and a mosque, and they brought together uh, Americans, Israelis, and Palestinians in dialogue. And they held the first summer program in 2003. And then we added, uh, that was in Chicago, and we added San Diego as a site in 2014. So our model uh, for engagement is based on dialogue, education, and action. And the summer program is where it all starts for our, our hands on their journey to becoming agents of change. And I think Stav and Elias will be able to tell you a little bit about uh, what that experience was like and how it influenced their lives, just in terms of the logistics of that program. Each summer we bring uh, around 80 American, Israeli, Palestinian, and Palestinian citizens of Israel, teenagers together in Chicago and San Diego 
for three weeks of facilitated dialogue and, and other um, activities. Uh, so the participants learn about each other, they learn about each other's narratives and how to listen and engage constructively in conversation uh, with people who see and think uh, differently than you do. Uh, as Stav mentioned, one of the most exciting parts I think about our program is um, the participants stay in the homes of American families, giving the, our participants from the Middle East uh, a feel for what home life is like for an average American family and giving our host families a, a connection to the Middle East that they otherwise never would have had and kind of a, a, a firsthand view of, of what the conflict is like. Um, so we continue to engage with our alumni after the summer program through education programs to continue learning about narratives about the conflict and to provide uh, skill building opportunities uh, for our alumni to learn the peace building skills like resiliency and negotiation or leadership that they can then use those skills to act for peace in their community and in their uh, or in the conflict. So it's kind of unpacking kind of what grassroots is. I think that our program kind of um, show, demonstrates that, that I think grassroots means engaging everyday people in the peace building process. And so for us, you know, we're up to nearly 700 alumni now who have participated with Hands of Peace. They're stretched across the world, but they're all connected through that experience of the summer program and their commitment to, to building positive peace. So these are individuals who have experience with the other. They've started that hard work of building trust with the other, and they've caught a vision for what peace can look like. Um, and I, I'm convinced that without individuals and like the network that we're building with Hands of Peace, uh, it won't matter you know, what political solutions there are in the conflict or what diplomats agree to, if there isn't that trust at the grassroots level, um, I don't think those political solutions would hold. Yeah, it's a great explanation. And I think, as you said, your organization demonstrates that clearly. Uh, Stav and Elias, I'd, I'd love to hear from you what prompted your participation in the program in the first place. And also just a little bit about what that experience was like. And Stav, let's begin with you. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, it was great fun. And um, I think I used to think of myself as a politically aware teenager. Uh, I took part in coexisting groups in middle school with friends from the neighboring Arab school. And um, I was very excited to travel to Chicago and meet uh, Palestinians from the occupied territories and American kids my age, whom I never met before. Um, Hands of Peace definitely shook my ground. I think that for the first time in my life, I heard and confronted Palestinians who were living uh, behind the fence, uh, being forced to spend hours in checkpoints, suffering from uh, daily humiliations from IDF soldiers, banned from meeting family members or other part of the country. Uh, and I was blown away. I felt like a whole parallel universe had been revealed to me, a very complicated one, a very sad universe that was full of suffering and injustice. Uh, and all of those story and all the information I got back then in Chicago, I could not forget and I could not erase this, erase it. And as well, uh, for the first time in my life, uh, stories from the news, from the media became people, became my friends. So when I came back to Israel, uh, to high school, I, I, I was completely not the same. I felt like I had to share, I had to spread the information and the notions I've learned. Uh, and from that point, uh, I remember in every history class I took, I started debating, arguing, uh, sometimes against my whole classmate and the professor. And I couldn't stop myself from giving the voice to the other side of the story. Um, the other side of the story that I've heard from my Palestinian friends in Chicago, and it was definitely an experience that completely changed my mind. Elias, and you? Yeah. So um, uh, for me, uh, I, I kind of uh, was in a similar place like uh, Stav. I, I, living in Haifa, I had interactions with Jewish Israelis. Haifa is a, is a mixed uh, city, Jewish Israelis and, and, and Palestinians or, or Arab Israelis live in, in the same place. But at, at the same time, I couldn't find a place to talk freely to the other side, to the Jewish Israelis about what I felt in a safe setting when it comes to the political situation. 
so Hands of Peace and the, and the dialogue program was, was, was the place to do that for me. Um, and once, uh, once you start doing that, uh, it, it, it's just, uh, you learn so much about, about your, yourself in, in the process. Because once you start formulating as a teenager, these ideas and these thoughts into words, uh, you really understand more what you feel like and, and where you come from. And it helped me get better acquainted with, with myself. It, it helped me formulate these thoughts and, 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 and ideas about who I want to be, about who I am, about my uh, uh, identity. Because uh, as a Palestinian living in, in Israel, it's, it's, it's not very clear. Uh, sometimes you grow up in, in a situation where that identity is not uh, crystallized yet. So I, I would say uh, being uh, wanting to understand more about this and about myself made me join uh, the, the program. Uh, and also, uh, a, 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 as a Palestinian living in Israel, I almost had no interaction, just like Stav, with uh, Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, especially around uh, the Second Intifada, the, the early 2000s. We were completely cut off. Um, so uh, I, I, it was also a place for me to, to wanting to, to learn about what uh, this part of my people is, is going through uh, from uh, firsthand, uh, uh, personal stories, uh, and not through the media. Uh, and uh, in, in, in the end, um, I, I also uh, I came from a home who was very politically involved, who discussed politics at, at dinner, and uh, who made sure that I, I went to demonstrations as a kid and as a teenager. So I, I was aware of what was going on, and I wanted to be part of changing the, the situation and changing the, the reality that I live in. Uh, so it, 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 all of these things just led me towards uh, joining a program like Hands of Peace. And uh, obviously as a teenager, I also wanted to travel by my own and see the world and meet uh, new friends from America and see what Americans live, live like. Uh, so all of these things uh, just uh, made me be, be part of Hands of Peace. And, uh, in a way, ever since, I, I never stopped being part of, of these kinds of uh, pr programs. Ever since 2004, uh, I've had a very long uh, history and, and presence present with, uh, uh, with, with Hands of Peace. Uh, and I, I uh, just uh, the last uh, summer program, I was also working as, as a facilitator in these, in these dialogues. So um, I feel I've, I've completed a, a full circle within the organization and within uh, uh, other organizations as well. Um, so that's why I'm also happy to be here. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I love hearing from both of you of the way that that experience didn't just stay in that summer program. It extended beyond that. And those stories became friends. And, and it's something we talk about at Telos is, is this idea of joyous implication that once you see, you can't be silent. You now have to be part of the solution. That's actually a joyous opportunity. And we're going to talk more about that later. And I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on that. But I want to jump back to Scott. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about how grassroots peacemaking necessarily has to support political agreements. And that's one thing that we emphasize here at TOS, that transformative peace requires both the political solutions and the reconciliation. So I'd love to hear more how you see this work fitting into that model and why grassroots reconciliation work is an essential building block for lasting and comprehensive peace. Yeah, so um, I, I think I mentioned that I served as a US diplomat um, and most recently in Jerusalem. So I arrived in Jerusalem uh, as a foreign service officer in 2017. And when I arrived, I was really focused on the political solutions to the conflict, right? That's your training and background as a, as a diplomat. Um, I didn't think too much, I really didn't know too much about grassroots or people to people peace building efforts between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, uh, so in arriving there, it didn't take long to see just how far apart politically the Israelis and Palestinians are, and with some of the uh, events uh, and U.S. policy uh, decisions that started to be taken in 2017 that, that made that situation even worse. Um, but what was even more stark for me than the political differences was as I started to meet people in my work and see how far apart, as Stav and Elias both just talked about, you know, having grown up and never met someone from the other side. Uh, uh, all their lives. Um, so I remember a conversation I had with a young woman from Tel Aviv who told me she had never met a Palestinian and, you know, 
another conversation with a young man from Gaza who told me that he he envisioned in his mind Israel as one large army camp because the only Israelis he ever met uh, were soldiers. Um, and those experiences and conversations really hit me that the, the work of reconciliation, like you said, that Telus talks about, and I think that Hands at Peace is working on, those people to people grassroots connections is going to be critical for political solutions to be able to take hold. Um, and so I think that's what Hands of Peace does. There are other organizations like ours that, that do, do this kind of work, really connecting everyday people to listen to the narrative from the other side, to learn how to constructively tell your own story. Um, as Elias talked about, you know, and Stav, I think as well, learning about yourself and how you fit in. Um, and I think those conversations start to build trust and it, it starts there. That, that trust, I don't think is an end in itself, uh, but it does allow you to begin to work through that reconciliation that will be necessary for, for political solutions to stick. So it really is, I think, two, two, two ends of a stick. You can't, you can't pick up one without the other. Mm, absolutely. I think that that word on trust is so, is so important. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, again from Stav and Elias, um, just about the long-term impacts of a program like this and how that trust that you formed in these relationships as a youth impacted your relationships um, going into adulthood and your decisions even. So um, I'd love to hear from both of you, how did this experience engaging in dialogue, committing to shared action, shape the decisions you made into adulthood? Um, and how has even your perspective shifted over time, you know, as the situation on the ground has changed, as the conflict and um, as the occupation have persisted? Awesome. Wanna go first? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think the most basic thing for me is I feel more at ease being with Jewish Israelis and having Jewish Israeli friends, because I feel that I can, because I, I, I first of all, know who I am and have, a, 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 have consolidated my, my political identity, uh, I feel f uh, uh, free enough to, to talk about these issues, even with my Jewish Israeli friends, uh, which wasn't the case before uh, going through something something like Hands of Peace. And, um, and, and, and it also, it, it gives me a lot of space uh, to do that. Um, and like I said before, uh, being part of a, of a dialogue program just made me want to stay involved in, in this type of work because I thought that this is really impactful work. So whenever I could during my life to, uh, to integrate that into my uh, uh, my, my, my daily life, I, I, I took the chance. When I could uh, I take part in, in other dialogue programs, uh, I, I did that. When I could uh, uh, be part uh, of, of Hands of Peace as a staff, I took that op opportunity. Um, and uh, during my, my medical studies, I, I, I did a, a two-year course with uh, another organization, Seeds of Peace, on, on, on facilitation and conflict resolution. And ever since then, I've been working as a facilitator in summer programs, uh, with Hands of Peace, with other organizations, uh, in, in, uh, in regional meetings uh, as well. So um, th this is my way of, of, of keeping this uh, uh, keeping this alive. Um, and I think in, in the end, if, if I look at it in a larger perspective, choosing uh, uh, medicine as, as, as the field that I wanna uh, professionally work in is also re related. I, I, I like working with people. I'd like to, to be in a place that uh, also uh, makes positive change. And I feel as a doctor, I, I have that opportunity to do that. And it, it's uh, ideally can be a place where that uh, is done without discrimination, which goes back to uh, to the because here uh, we find discrimination almost in every field, and I and I would like to think that that, that medicine is 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 the, is the is the most advanced in that sense, as it treats everyone uh, here uh, in, in in Israel uh, as close as possible to being to being equal. Um, so all, all of these things just uh, uh, started from being part of, of a dialogue uh, organization. And if, if I look at the, at, at the long run, at the, at the big picture, I think it's, it's right. It's hard to say that the conditions of the conflict and the occupation uh, have improved since uh, 2004 when we took part of, of the program. But uh, I can say that, that doing this work is actually what's keeping me hopeful 
uh, that this can actually change. And, and, and this, is, this is my activism, being part of these types of organizations and, and doing facilitation work and, and talking to people about this issue at home and, 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 and outside of it uh, is uh, something that is uh, actually keeping me uh, happy and, and, and content in the current situation. Um, I, uh, agree, I agree with everything you said, Elias. Um, for me, Hands of Peace uh, affected me the most from all the things I've learned, and especially, as you mentioned, um, engaging in dialogue and, uh, and uh, to be committed to a shared action. Uh, it affected me uh, the most um, through my activism. As I mentioned before, I initiated uh, a, a national uh, women's strike here in Israel against uh, violence against women, uh, domestic violence. Um, and of all exciting thing about the national strike, um, and really it was way bigger than we ever thought it would be with uh, hundreds of thousands of women striking all over the country, 150 protest centers, hospitals, school, huge Israeli companies, all uh, major uh, local authorities, uh, workers organization that supported the strike. Um, also in the main rally in uh, Rabin Square, um, there were uh, more than 30,000 women. And I think that um, of all, this, uh, all the exciting things about the national strike, uh, the, most, um, the most exciting things for me was the, the, the deep and uncompro uncompromising uh, partnership between Jewish and uh, Palestinian citizens women. Uh, we knew all along from the beginning that we must do it together. Uh, as Arab women are uh, almost 50% of the murdered women in Israel, uh, but, uh, but the Palestinian citizens are only 20% of the population. Uh, so we found the, the widest common denominator, the female identity in that case, and we, we did not let go of our hands, uh, even when we encountered the deepest conflicts um, that almost broke us, but we knew uh, all along that only together we can make a change. Um, and in the main rally uh, that day of the strike, there were women from all over the country. It was such a beautiful sight to see uh, from all ages, all colors, all classes, all nationalities. And uh, like my mom said, uh, that for two hours, it felt like there was peace. Because uh, on the stage, we spoke in Hebrew and in Arabic, shoulder to shoulder, Jewish and Palestinian women fighting uh, literally for our lives and, and for this society, for our society. And I think, um, why am I telling all that? Because I think that uh, that is exactly the deepest, the, the, the deepest message uh, that Hand of Peace uh, has installed in me. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what really illuminated uh, my way along uh, many intersections in my life. Uh, as an activist, I think that um, what, what I learned, like the, the, the deepest notion was that uh, for me that there is no unspeakable conflict that, that cannot find the true connection between human beings. Uh, I think that on the basis of human connection and a vision for a better future, a vision for change, uh, we can build partnership. And uh, as Elias said, uh, that, uh, that thing from Hand of Peace uh, um, made me be very optimistic and very hopeful because I know that uh, with uh, friendship, relationships, partnerships, um, uh, change can occur for sure. Mm. I think that's such an important word. And, uh, you know, a lot of the people who come on our trips or are, uh, associated with us, we talk about, you know, what does it look like to take the next action step, right? To move forward towards peace and looking at a situation or a conflict as complex and um, difficult as this conflict, it can feel overwhelming, but you found an opportunity for shared action on something and you went for it across these lines of difference. What an amazing you know, event that you held and, and um, opportunity that you had to speak into this issue um, in both communities. I think that's amazing. Um, I'd love Scott to hear from you maybe more um, if you have them 
stories of some of these long-term impacts. You mentioned earlier, um, 700 alumni have come through the program. Um, I'd love to know if there's, you know, any other stories that you know of, or, you know, just more broadly, some of the long-term impacts of the work. Yeah, and I, I love the way Stav and Elias, I think they both just kind of explained the long-term impacts, right? Of, I mean, they, they both participated in the program in 2004 and how it's influenced their decisions and what they want to do with their lives. And, and I think it's, you know, not just about, like Elias said, it's hard maybe to make that connection from, from hands of peace and how does that lead to peace in the conflict, but it's, it's, it's doing the things like, like Stav talked about, building positive peace, building attitudes and structures and and you know, it, creating an environment where peace can flourish and, and taking action for that. Um, hands of peace, you know, there, there have been studies done about the kinds of peace building programs that we do and that they, to show that they do produce positive attitudinal shifts in Israeli and Palestinian participants who, who participate in these kinds of programs. Um, there, and just to kind of con compare and contrast, there was, a, there was a poll done by an Israeli and Palestinian pollster in October of last year that showed that 90% of Palestinians don't trust Israelis and 79% of Israelis don't trust Palestinians. Um, so you contrast that with a study that was done on one peace building program, I think in 2015 or 16, that showed that 77% of young people who participated in that particular program reported an increased belief in the possibility of reconciliation and 71% reported increased trust and empathy for the other. So, Clearly the program and their experience, like Elias and Saab have talked about, had an experience, or sorry, had, a, had an impact um, that then in some cases, like as Stav discussed, led to you know, being able to take action or Elias, how he wants to be involved in, in the work that he does in medicine. Um, I know there are critics who, who, who say that if you're seeing these positive shifts and that trust is starting to be built through these kinds of programs, why doesn't that lead to, to change on the ground? Um, and I think it's a fair question. It's one I asked myself when I when I worked in the field um, as a diplomat in Jerusalem. And I think it's one that we in the peace building field need to, to kind of wrestle with. Um, one of the things, and I think we've kind of touched on it here already, uh, one of the, I think a compelling reason why we maybe don't see the change on the ground um, as a result of these kinds of programs is that so many of these programs happen in isolation. Uh, so there may be a Palestinian living in Nablus uh, or an Israeli living in Beersheba who participated, for example, let's say with Hands of Peace. And they may not know that their neighbor participated in a similar program with the Parents Circle Families Forum or with Seeds of Peace, right? So if you have had this life-changing experience um, that really transformed the way you see yourself and the world and your role in it, but you're not surrounded by people who share that view, you may be hesitant to kind of raise your voice and, and share your story and, and talk about those things. And I think that's part of what we're trying to do in Hands of Peace by energizing and activating our alumni. And I think Elias talked about this, you know, surrounding yourself with people who, who share that vision uh, and who, who believe in and are ready to act for peace. Um, and I think it's incumbent really on us as an organization and on us as a peace building field to help make those connections and help our alumni see that there's not just, you know, several hundred, uh, 700 who participated with Hands of Peace, but there's thousands of Palestinians and Israelis who have participated in these programs with many organizations um, who are out there and have the same belief and the same commitment. And, and maybe it's you know, a matter of making those connections to, and, and helping them see that they're not alone in, in raising their voice for, for peace and for change. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting point. Um, and just a you know, short plug on, we're hosting part two of this webinar series next week with an organization called the Alliance for Middle East Peace, which is a network of these grassroots peace building organizations which Hands of Peace is part of. Um, so for all those in attendance, would encourage you to, to join us next week and learn more about the efforts to bring these groups together and to make this, this field um, have a sense of unity um, together. Um, my next question, Elias, is, is kind of similar or related to what Scott was talking about, about um, I guess some of the criticism towards organizations um, that do this work about um, what is called or referred to as, you know, normalizing the occupation. So bringing in Palestinian youth for dialogue and exchange, but not changing life for them under occupation, which they return to after the program. Um, so from your perspective as a Palestinian citizen of Israel, um, why do you choose to get, engage with the program and stay engaged, you know, for so long? Um, and how is Hands of Peace different? How is this organization um, actually creating opportunities for reconciliation and peace? 
Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, this is a very good question. And this is a, a question a lot of us as Palestinians, whether in, in, in Israel or uh, in, in the West Bank face, uh, whenever we are associated with, with dialogue or, or organizations. Uh, I can't give a general answer about all organizations, but I know about Hands of Peace because I've been part of it as a participant and as staff, as a facilitator. And from my work as, as someone who's actually facilitating the dialogue, I know what goes on inside the dialogue. And I can tell you that that does not represent normalization in any, in any way. And this is what I actually tell my Palestinian friends who, who say that to me. Um, the organization does not uh, in any way uh, uh, put pressure on, on, on the Palestinian or the Israeli kids to, to do something or to be someone that they, that they aren't. And I, I, I don't believe the organization uh, assumes to change uh, uh, the uh, to, to to change the the current reality on on, on the ground. It, it it does foster the the feeling of of empowerment, and 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 it, it encourages and I encourage as a facilitator in dialogue for people to share their uh, reality. We bring that reality into the program. We do not hide from it, and we do not avoid it. It's something that the the the, the participants face on a daily basis in the dialogue. And if, even if they try to, try to run away from it, it's my job as a, facil as a facilitator to reflect that and to bring that reality back to them because this is what they will be facing once they go back home. The, 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 they know that the reality doesn't change even though they're having a pleasant and very fun time in Chicago or San Diego uh, in Hands of Peace. They know that this is not the situation they will, be, will go back to. And they have to understand and they have to uh, uh, try to figure out how to maybe in some way work to make that happen back at home. Um, so I, I think this is my, my, my answer to, to all those uh, accusations uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, being a normalizer. Um, and uh, as long as, as, as the dialogue is a central part of the program and the dialogue is, is centered around the participants and not around uh, uh, education or anything that is uh, uh, coming from outside uh, the participants themselves, it is not normalization in, in my opinion, because this is the, the, the context and, 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 the, uh, and, and the personal stories that they bring is what make the, the program uh, uh, happen. And I know also you, both you and Scott talked about how the, the conversation, the collaboration doesn't just end the summer program. There's actual, actually regional meetups. Can you talk briefly about what those yeah. are and how this continues after the program? Yeah, yeah. actually uh, uh, the regional meetings were, were the thing that keeps keep you in, involved in, uh, in, in Hands of Peace. Uh, so uh, uh, these, uh, the nature of, of these meetings changed uh, throughout the time because I've been involved in 2003, we're in 2020. So a lot of change uh, have changed uh, since then. But in, in the last few, few years, uh, there, there would be uh, uh, overnight seminars, two, uh, two to three days, um, usually centering around a, a topic that is related to the conflict. Uh, the dialogue sessions will be uh, centered ar around the topic and we will have uh, uh, some, some, so some sort of, of, of input both from a Palestinian and an Israeli perspective from other organizations, or uh, we would uh, be on location on a certain tour uh, uh, to learn about a certain topic that is relevant to the place that we will be staying at. Uh, and, uh, and this is what basically uh, uh, connects the, keeps the participant connected and they actually connect from different years as well of participation. So it gives a feeling of the community of, of Hands of Peace through these uh, uh, regional meetings. Mm. Absolutely. Scott, do you want to add something? No, I think that's great. No, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Stop, I'd love to hear from you next. Um, in recent years, Israeli politics has shifted rightward in a sense. Um, very few mainstream parties mention the conflict in their platforms. Many actively endorse policies that contribute to conflict, such as the expansion of settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Um, I'd love to hear more from your perspective, how you understand your role as a Jewish Israeli um, in transforming the conflict. 
Well, uh, as you all uh, probably know, uh, this passing um, 18 month more or less, uh, was great opportunity for all of us to hear um, from all the parties uh, and politicians what they think because uh, we are facing uh, the fourth election uh, this coming March. Um, so yes, that is definitely um, a situation when everything is uh, moving rightward. Um, I think that when I recall uh, that summer in 2004 in Chicago, uh, I am grateful for a spiritual movement, um, if I can put it that way, that I learned from the experience that um, if there is if there is a, a problem, conflict, uh, any any sort of injustice, the way is not to run away, uh, not to avoid, uh, but uh, but on the contrary, um, you need gently and sensitively uh, treat the wound, and, and acknowledge all the the past pains, and and look forward to the future uh, with po positive energies uh, of doing and and, and creating. Um, and because of that, I, I believe that as a Jewish Israeli, uh, on the public matter, my job is to resist, resist the occupation uh, and the violence in any way and any platform, on the streets, on the media, in the voting booth, uh, and of course, demand it from the decision makers. Um, but not less important, I think that on the private sphere, with my friends, family, uh, other students, colleagues, um, my job is to talk about the conflict, to argue, to raise awareness. In my eyes, these days, uh, one of the major problem uh, in, inside the Jewish society regarding the conflict is not hostility, as you might uh, think, but, uh, but it's the indifference. It's the, it's the fact that this occupation, this conflict is going on for so many years and so many people are hopeless, don't know if it could be ever solved. And people are just the the I I see it in the in the Jewish society that indifference is everywhere. That people are just uh, think feel that if they won't think about it, it uh, nothing will happen. And um, and that's what I think that we must fight for our generations and for the future generations. Mm, I think that that feeling of indifference is, is so true, at least as, as I've you know, read about it and heard about it from people on the ground. Um, and something that we talk about at Telos is, you know, when, when these conflict, these situations seem so impossible um, that actually our response is not to give up hope, it's actually to act in hope. Um, and we quote Reverend Mitri Rahab when he says, hope is what we do. So hope is an action, it's an active verb. Um, I'd love to hear from you all just briefly, how, how do you act in hope? You know, when there is that sense of indifference or when, when it feels like things have, you know, persisted for so long, nothing has changed. Um, how do you act in hope when it feels like the momentum is moving possibly in the wrong direction? Uh, I would say very similar to what, uh, to what staff said. Uh, I work small, I start with my community uh, I start with my friends and, and, and the people that are around me, my, my co-workers, uh, and do not ignore the, the situation and do not try to push it under the rug. I bring it up and I, I, I open a place for discussion for it and a place for dialogue. And I, could, I, I try to hear as much as possible and, and, and say what, what, what I think and what I feel. Um, and, and, and anywhere I can, I can move to action, whether it be uh, uh, in a demonstration that I, can, I believe in and I, I go and take part of, or if I can uh, uh, find places to facilitate dialogue, which is also feels as part of my, my, my activism and, and my way of, of bringing change. And uh, in the end, I, I also always look to, uh, to, to empower my own community through uh, a, a, a social projects, uh, and uh, things that I can offer uh, as, as a doctor, as, a, as an individual. Um, yeah. agree. Once again, I agree with you. <laughs> um, and uh, on, the, on the level of ideology, 
Um, my boyfriend is uh, always telling me that I'm a, I'm a, a helpless optimist. Uh, and I always tell him when we argue about politics, that of course I'm always right, that uh, war and, and armed conflict, we have tried for over a hundred years. Uh, and uh, as, as we all know, the, the results are definitely undesirable, uh, but we haven't tried dialogue and compromising and peace. Um, I would like to tell uh, my, my future the granddaughter um, that uh, even though maybe I haven't changed the world, uh, at least I've tried. So uh, definitely I'm, a, I'm an optimistic and I will uh, continue to be. So David, the way I act in hope, um, so you know, I think I mentioned I, I worked for the US government for 10 years and, and left about a year and a half ago. Um, and I, you know, I had been working on the conflict there. Obviously it's not, it's not my conflict, but I fell in love with the land and with the people and wanted to find a way to contribute. And, and also there's conflicts in our own country and in our, my own community, right? And, and how do I find hope and act and hope in those? And for me, it's, it was joining hands of peace and participating in Telos uh, events. Um, what helps me act in hope is surrounding myself with people who choose light over darkness. And that, that doesn't mean choosing people or surrounding myself with people who think like I do in every single aspect or political discussion, but people who, when, when it comes down to it, will choose will choose light over darkness. And I think that's what Elias and Stav have done. I think that's what Telos does and, and promotes. Um, and so, yeah, being a part of that community uh, helps me. Um, to, to have the hope to, to keep going and keep working. Absolutely, that's beautiful. And I think that's definitely part of our mission, you know, at TELUS is we forming these communities of peacemakers who can act together in shared action. Even across, you know, those lines of difference, we can disagree, you know, we can find commonality on what step we can take forward. Um, and, you know, most of the people on this call, in fact, are U.S. citizens and, you um, I think it can be easy to think that's just a conflict over there. Like this doesn't involve me, but something I find interesting about Hands of Peace is that you also draw in American youth to these programs. Um, so I'd love to hear from you, Scott, why you find it important to, to bring in American youth and, and also what role do US citizens, even the people on this call have in supporting a future of security, dignity and freedom for Israelis and Palestinians? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, when I was interviewing for the position with Hands of Peace, one of the questions that one of the team members asked me is, was basically that, what is the American role in this conflict and why do you think it's important? Um, and it stumped me at the time. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, that since. Um, I, think it, it's, I think there's a lot of reasons Americans get involved and I think there's two main reasons, at least for me, that I think it's valuable and, and worthwhile. One is, and I, this is speaking for myself personally, and I imagine many people on this call, the land itself that we're talking about, Israel and Palestine, is important to my faith. Um, so as a Christian, I relish the opportunity to live in Jerusalem for two years to visit all the sites with my family. But what became even more powerful and, and left more lasting impression was the friendships and relationships we formed with Palestinians and Israelis of all stripes. And the pain and the ache that we feel at seeing the uncertainty and the violence and pain that defines their lives. And so you know, I wanted to find a way, and I think like many on this call, to when you see someone in distress, you want to help, you want to contribute uh, and, and help where you can. Um, so I think there's that pull for Americans. And I think, I think more than that, and I think this speaks to the question about why do we think it's important to involve American youth and not just youth, but, but our entire Hands of Peace community. I think, uh, and maybe this is, maybe I'm biased because of my background, but I think whatever peace process or negotiation or political solutions there are uh, to the conflict, I think the United States uh, from a political and policy standpoint will play, a, will play an important role. Uh, and in my mind, um, for the United States to be able to play that role constructively, we need to have a more nuanced and uh, conversations and, and policy discussions around the conflict uh, here in our own country. So I think that's what organizations like Telos and Hands of Peace do. I think they play an important role in exposing more Americans to the complexities and narratives of the conflict. And like I said, for us, it isn't just about the young participants that we have, the young Americans, but it's our donors, it's our the host families, it's the volunteers, everyone who touches uh, our participants or program in some way and gives them an opportunity to learn about the conflict for themselves. 
Um, and to me, I think the more Americans that understand the conflict, I think the better our conversations will be. And I think that contributes to better policy. Mm. I, I said that to a friend recently and he said, how does a family hosting a Palestinian in Chicago lead to better policy conversations in Washington? And I have to be honest, I can't draw that direct line just like I can't draw the direct line between, you know, what we're doing as an organization and what TELOS is doing and to how that will ultimately look like in, in, in peace in the Middle East. But I think to your point, David, I think what we're doing is we're building community and we're helping people see that they aren't alone in their vision for peace. So, you know, we hear from Chicago and San Diego and Tel Aviv and Ramallah and, and literally all around the world on this call. And we're all motivated by the same uh, vision and love for, for the land and for the people and for what we hope can be be built there in terms of positive peace. So I think we can we can change the tenor of the conversations in our own lives as we engage with it. And we that then helps us change the conversation in our communities. And I think it spreads out from there. Absolutely. I think that's that's spot on, especially the way we think about it. I mean, our, our theory of change sees that when leaders encounter the conflict and countless issue like the leaders in, in your program, um, the youth who come on these exchange programs and during the summer, they then go out into their communities and bring people in. And those people are implicated and they learn. And then all of a sudden this movement is beginning to form, like you're saying, this community. And together that movement can create the momentum necessary to begin changing the policy, to begin moving from the grassroots up to um, the higher policy levels. So I think that's a great, great point. Um, I'd love now to just turn to um, our audience and, and give them all a chance to ask some questions. Um, so thank you all for, for putting in questions into the chat and encourage you to continue doing that as you have them. Um, we have some time left. Um, so I'd like to first invite um, Sarah, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Yeah, so first of all, thank you to you three for joining us today. It's been really great to hear about your experiences with this. Um, the question that comes to my mind is coming from a different telos kind of principle of peacemaking, and that's that we have to see the world as it is before we can change it to be the way we want it to be. And thinking specifically about the fact that your different participants are all equal as peacemakers and come together to, to this community as equals, um, and yet go home and experience very different concrete realities and experience some of the really you know, important things you're discussing differently. I'd love to hear you all talk a little bit more about how you address in your work the fact that everyone are equal as peacemakers and yet there's some really different experiences with violence and power um, back at home before and after the program. Thank you. Uh, if I may, uh, I think uh, as a facilitator, it's important for me for the participants in the room to feel equal as in the opportunity, as they have the same opportunity to speak and same opportunity to express themselves. They do not bring necessarily uh, equal uh, um, like uh, um, weight to the uh, to the dialogue. Some of the participants may not have been involved in, in, in anything that is related to the conflict in any direct way, while others have. And, and this is a reflection of the reality back at home. And this is something important to acknowledge both for the participants and both uh, for the program as a program. And I think uh, um, like Hands of Peace understands that and understands that there are different needs and different uh, 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 things that the communities of Hands of Peace needs, whether it, it be on the Palestinian side or whether it, it be on, on the Israeli side. And, 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 and that's why as, as a program, we have also uh, uh, uninational programming as well, where uh, each uh, uh, delegation, whether it be the Palestinians or the Jewish Israelis or the Palestinian citizens of Israel have their own uh, uh, meetings and, and their own things to work on as, uh, as a group. Um, so uh, again, this like going back to the normalization issue, we do not uh, say that everyone is, is a blank page and equal once they come to the program. No, they come with the, everything that's been put up on their shoulders uh, from reality and they go back empowered to deal with it fr from the things that they gained through the program. Um, for me, uh, thank you for the question, Sarah. It, uh, 
it touches a very uh, sensitive point uh, for me. I remember it for being a uh, very hard to, to really comprehend the fact that um, this conflict is not uh, equal in matter of, of, of power. Uh, of course, not as a teenager. I could not, um, I could not deeply understand it uh, as I grew up in a very Zionist um, environment. Uh, that uh, our suffer is, uh, and the other side suffering is not, is not the same. Um, not not on the same uh, level and not on the same um, um, depth, I would say. And I think that uh, after I was in hands of peace and, and hearing stories from teenagers my age, not telling me about someone else's suffering, but sharing their own stories about themselves, their, their family, um, uh, incidents and situations that they witnessed and they are going through uh, daily throughout their whole lives, uh, that completely changed my mind in that matter. I could not tell myself anymore that uh, his experience and my experience are completely the same. And, um, and although it took me a, a not a long time to, to understand it, uh, because of this intense and very powerful experience in Chicago, after I came back and I mentioned before that I had to almost fight uh, everyone uh, in order to convince them uh, on, the, on my new notions and information that I got, um, this, this struggle uh, I kept on from every, everyone I talked to. Still, still today, it is something that is very, very difficult for, uh, for Israelis um, to, to really understand it without meeting and dialoguing with, uh, with the Palestinian. If I could just add one thing, Sarah, thanks. I think it's a great question and it's a really important one and one that I think we as an organization, uh, to be honest, struggle with, right? And how do you, because like you said, when they come to the United States, everyone's on the same playing field. It's kind of relatively equal, right? They're all meeting together, but then they know they're going to go home and it's going to be a different reality than the way the, what they've been experiencing. Um, I think what comes to mind is kind of a uh, conversation I had a couple of months ago with some of our other alumni. And there was a Palestinian um, named Muhammad from Nablus. And he talked about participating in one of our seminars that the alumni participate, uh, as Elias described. Um, and he said they, they were gathered and they were beginning to have a dialogue. And there was an Israeli uh, colleague who showed up a little bit late and he came in his uh, military uniform. He had just come from service and he had just finished his day. You can imagine what that did to the room. And, and Muhammad said it was really hard because he said this individual was someone he really loved and had really connected with. He said, but to see him in such a visible symbol of the occupation with his weapon and everything um, really kind of blew up the discussion. And, and I think my understanding is the facilitator handled it well and they were able to use it as kind of an opportunity to discuss and learn as, as, as Stav just talked about dialoguing about what does this mean and is this something we want in our community and how does this work? Um, it's something I think that we grew out of that in a conversation that we had in that conversation and that Elias and Safa both talked about is the need for unilateral dialogue and, and discussions. Um, I know for our Israeli delegation, they, they want to talk about this. What is the role of the army? How, how do we go from being you know, 15, 16 year old participants in hands of peace? We're going to go through that experience, many of us, and how do we grapple with that and how do we come out the other side? And for the Palestinians, you know, they watch their friends that they've made and, and, and and colleagues and people that they started to build trust with go through that. So I think holding that space unilaterally, uh, that's what we, that's the term we use but within the delegations to be able to, to have those discussions and talk about that. Um, and, and like you said, the, to face the reality that it, it, it's not, you're not sweeping under the rug, but this is the reality we're dealing with and, and being open and honest about it. We have a question from Davida, if you would like to unmute yourself. Going from Scott and big picture to small me. Um, I'm a supporter of Hands of Peace in San Diego and have been 
um, as part of the uh, San Diego Foundation since, uh, I guess, 2016. Um, there's nothing that warms my heart like hearing about the coalescing of various groups, um, peacemaking groups on the ground and not only peacemaking, but the specific projects that they're doing. And my question was, um, is this, uh, we hear here a lot about recently the uh, inequality, if you would, of the vaccine distribution or the lack of this vaccine distribution in Palestine. And I wondered if that was a project that this coalition of, um, you know, all of you, the grassroots people, might be able to address in some way and um, led by Elias. No, uh, to get that out, it's a humanitarian thing. It's not even, you know, a political thing. It's so important. So I would love to see, I know that Hands of Peace does projects afterwards and, and that I always am encouraging that idea of students not uh, alumni not only meeting and discussing but doing end of speech end of question thanks Davida uh yeah that's a great question and I think I think that really speaks to the question that Sarah was asking right and it, it's just another example of the inequality and the imbalance and the power differences um in in the conflict and in the region um and so I, I would have to think about that if there's something that we could do as an organization specifically, uh, or as like you mentioned, a, a broader peace building field. But I think certainly, uh, and I know um, Alnep that David mentioned, uh, Hellas is gonna speak with next week, is doing more to draw attention to this and talk about this and to talk about not only the vaccines, but how the pandemic itself has um, inequitably uh, you know, been harder on the Palestinians and on, on certain populations within both countries. Um, so I think drawing attention to that is is part of the work that we do uh, to start those conversations, and then from there we you know look to people like Elias and stuff who have experience identifying a problem and and def and leading action to to find ways to to act uh, on that. Thank you. We have a question from Buzz. If you would like to unmute and ask it. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks everyone for being here. This is great. Um, I'm primarily directing my question to our younger participants. Um, sometimes I find that in the various stripes of American culture, sport helps to bring people together. Yeah, it tends to equalize and of course form bonds. I'm wondering if, and I may be very naive, there's any opportunity at what we call the scholastic or high school level or thereabouts for the youths on both sides to be able to engage in the sport. Could a soccer team play a soccer team from the other side or anything like that? And whether you think that would be helpful. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a great uh, field for a um, sport, for a, for meeting, dialoguing and, and, and just, just even like to see uh, the other side. And I wish we could do it more in uh, younger ages, as you said, because unfortunately the reality here in Israel now that uh, football specifically, uh, soccer is the main uh, sport here and the racism uh, on soccer is absolutely obnoxious. It's, it's uh, impossible to, to hear and uh, and it's definitely a route that we should take uh, and start it uh, as young as we can. Because as I said before, I, I believe that meeting, uh, of course, playing with, um, with the kids your age uh, in such a, a good and healthy purpose like sport, uh, it's, it's such a great field to make change. Uh, I think it's it, it's very complicated. Like uh, like Stav said, like technically doing it is is very complicated because uh, like first of all, I, I wouldn't just like to have a ball between the teams and let them play because because for me that wouldn't serve the uh, the 
like the purpose of, of, of making change. Uh, because I would want them to first talk and, and, and have some sort of dialogue. And that's where we come back to the, like, to the norm normalization uh, uh, talk. Uh, if people are just doing things just to do things together, for me as a Palestinian, it's not enough. I don't want to just play soccer with an Israeli as if things are normal and we're just having uh, a, a soccer match. I would want uh, uh, to have a, a, a dialogue to talk about why I don't get to, to, to have enough soccer fields, why I can't have a national team in my country and all of these things that can be related to soccer. And then if, if, we, if we get to a point where we, we have the, the next part is a soccer game, that would be, uh, uh, makes more sense for me as a Palestinian because I have a lot more things to do before just rolling a ball uh, with an is 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 Israeli to actually a a address this kind of topic. Thanks, Buzz. Uh, we have a question next from Angus, if you'd like to unmute and ask it. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the great dialogue. Uh, my question is uh, specific to the kind of culture of, uh, let's say, rhetoric and conversation on um, American university campuses, particularly. Um, I guess the question is, how do we encourage this type of dialogue in an environment that has really become as polarized as the, the American political climate, if, if not more polarized, um, to the point where, you know, this year I've been noticing on, on social media, um, let's say sites connected to these conversations that even a new term called both sidesism has emerged as a kind of derogatory term. So even any of these kind of ideas that exist on university campuses usually get impugned with this kind of like, there's not a both sides here. And if you try to have these conversations, you get accused of being affiliated with the most extreme viewpoint of the other side, whatever that other side is perceived to be and, and connected to the kind of notions of, of grassroots of kind of changing opinions, um, you know, culturally, I mean, I think that doing this without the university, um, in my opinion, you know, uh, lacks a lot of power in terms of grassroots movement. Yeah, I think that's a great question and something, and like you said, that it's not just applicable to, to, to discussions on American campuses about, about the Middle East conflict specifically, but kind of American politics in general. Uh, and I had not heard that both sides as in before, but I, that's, that's frightening, right? To think that that can be thrown away as, or, sorry, thrown around as a derogatory term that as someone who is willing to, to sit down and listen and seek to understand. Uh, and I think that's something that, I think that's um, maybe a, a role that our, our American participants could play. And this is something actually that we've been talking about the last couple of months with, with some of our alumni who have said, our American alumni, I should say specifically, who have said, hey, can you help us organize on campuses and not to do great movements, but to, to maybe in some way recreate the hands of peace experience, help them facilitate conversations and, and provide that space where people can see that both sides and sitting down and listening with someone doesn't mean that you have to agree with or, you know, convince them to join your side, but simply holding that space where a conversation can happen, um, which is what we have, I think we have with our dialogue experience in, in Chicago and San Diego, or, yeah, San Diego, um, and that we could uh, create opportunities for our alumni to hold those spaces on their own campus. So that's something that we're, we're discussing internally. And I think, um, yeah, there was an article, I think, earlier this week in the New York Times uh, about this issue that was, frankly, shocking in a lot of ways, frightening to think that the, the, to see the level of conversations and just how, I should say, the, how the low level, how low they've gone um, and the demonization uh, of the other side. And um, yeah, I think it's a broader cultural issue that we have in the United States um, and we need to be well, we find those spaces where we can sit down and, and listen. Scott, I think that's spot on. And Elias and staff, feel free to jump in here. But what something that we talk about at TELUS as well is um, in our practices of peacemaking that the first practice is listening to understand. That love's first act is to listen, uh, which Paul Tillich said, um, and that 
before we can get to the action, before we can get to this collaboration, we must first be willing and able and give opportunity to hearing um, the perspective of you know the other, I mean, the person that we've silenced or been unwilling to hear from. Um, so I think it's so important, and you know, the hands of peace is doing work like this. Um, and then this is you know such a central part of our work in the U.S. is talking about how do we move past the toxic polarization of our age. So I would encourage you to to check out our resource, the principles and practices of peacemaking, on our website um, and dive into that, share that, practice it. Um, it's a really helpful resource. But Stav and Elias, I don't know if you have anything to add. Great, we have, oh, go ahead, Elias. Uh, I just wanted to say that that uh, it, 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 we, we can really see that in like in dialogue when people first come to the dialogue room, uh, it's very hard to them to listen to someone else speaking. And they would interrupt every few minutes just to either say something or to ask. Um, and, and, and they can't really uh, listen and take in a whole story. And with time, this is a, a skill that, that uh, we as facilitators and, and in the dialogue room, this is something that, that we work on, how to do uh, uh, listening and compassionate listening and understanding uh, of, of, of whoever is speaking and, and knowing that his personal story doesn't take away from your own. So you, you don't have to jump in and cut him and, 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 and say what you've been through because it's still there and, and you still own that. Uh, but at the, at the same time, uh, you, you can also listen and appreciate to what uh, the other person is speaking in the room. Hmm. Absolutely. And we have time for one more quick question before wrapping up here. Troy, Patrick, if you'd like to unmute. Yeah, hello. Uh, it was kind of related to, uh, my question's kind of related to uh, the sports question. So I uh, am a dancer, I'm an artist. Uh, in theater and such. And I did a program in South Africa where we were trying to bridge a very uh, divided community that's very much so still very segregated. It was a very small town called Mimo. Uh, and we were using dance to do that and the arts and through the kids. And so trying to get uh, kids to dance together and kids to create together. And it wasn't as much dialogue uh, focused because kids often don't have like the words or the way to like talk about what it is that they're they're going through and that experience um but then when you put them in a room together to do something that's completely unrelated uh that can become related like through the arts or whatever them expressing themselves or just having fun together uh that created a space for uh trust between the between the kids from different communities between teachers from different communities um and uh and people from different backgrounds that were uh uh previously very against each other that wouldn't be able to even have a discussion with each other and suddenly we have we have people all working together on a project that um that brought them together in that kind of way um and i was wondering i know there's been sports programs in south africa that have been similar to that where they bring people together and i was wondering if there is any programs for kids because they often like dialogue over a conflict that maybe they don't quite understand can be very difficult um if there's any programs like that bridging that gap through the arts or through uh, sports for kids um, so that they can uh, start those dialogues in a way that they're building friendships along the way. Is there any kind of uh, programs, peace building programs that are similar to that? Um, thanks for the question, Troy. Um, as I said before, I do believe that we should do it. Uh, um, uh, we should, we should um, produce and participate in any program possible uh, in order to meet and, uh, and to, to build the, the bridges to the other, any other, uh, specifically in that conflict. Uh, I know of a, of a, a few programs, and I'm sure there are more. I grew up in northern Israel, in a, like in the countryside, in a rural place, and I'm sure that um, there are many, many more. And uh, I agree with you, and, uh, and uh, I totally think the same that um, any any kind of um, any kind of thing it can be either sports or arts that. Uh, that allow us to work together as a whole or, or to face the, the conflict in, in other ways that can, 
that can um, that can show the focus on other parts of the conflict and to create dialogue. I think uh, um, it's the it's the best way to do it. And again, I think we need to start it since uh, preschool, kindergarten, and uh, so we will not uh, learn all the 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 stigmas um, in a in a in a young age because then it's much harder to change it. Uh, I, w I want to also add that, uh, like there, are, I think what you're you're offering or what you imagine is 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 uh, is more applicable to uh, uh, inside Israel within Palestinians living in Israel and Jewish Israelis, uh, such as myself. And in fact, there are a lot of programs that uh, work through these uh, kind of uh, uh, themes through art, and there's actually. Um, uh, a bilingual school, uh, a network of, of, of a bilingual school. Uh, if, I don't know if everyone knows, but the uh, education here is basically segregated until, until university. Uh, there are Arabic speaking schools, Hebrew speaking schools, uh, so the, the, the kids don't really meet. And in these bi bi bilingual schools, the kids do meet and they have all sorts of, of, of course, the, the uh, uh, classes and extracurricular activities. Uh, like you uh, uh, discussed, but in a in a larger uh, uh, um, outlook, looking at the uh, Palestinians in West Bank or Gaza and uh, Israelis, I think it wouldn't be again smart to do that because uh, you would be trying to force something uh, when the ground is is not ready. I I don't imagine uh, uh, the program like the one that you did would be uh, happening during. Uh, 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 the 90s or or the apartheid uh, south south uh, africa time uh it, it was just not the time to do something like that because uh there were too much uh differences um and then it would be in in equal to one side to bring it to another to bring them to another place and another uh, uh experience which does not resemble uh, everyone else's and and uh, actually the, like i'm missing like the value so I would totally encourage and, and, and be in, so, in support of doing that within is Israel. And I think that's something we need because both as uh, a citizens of, of this country, we are not equal and we have a lot to work through, uh, which working at it from a young age can certainly help. Thanks for that question, Troy. And we are out of time, but I'd love to hear just 30 seconds. Scott, how can people on this call continue to support Hands of Peace? Sure. So I encourage you to check out our website, handsofpeace.org. Uh, and of course, uh, the we, or in fact, this morning we had a conversation as a team is how do we get people involved and people who want to engage with us? A big part of what we do is volunteers. Um, so we have an, a spot to sign up to be a volunteer with us. We, of course, always are happy to accept donations and contributions to help us in our work. And um, I'll just one plug, and I don't want to take away from Telos, but I know Telos does trips to the region. We also do our multi-narrative trips to the region where we have an opportunity to meet with Elias and Stav and other alumni from the program. And we're planning to do a trip in September, um, all things uh, going well with the pandemic. So there's an opportunity to get to hear, to see the region, but also engage with Hands of Peace uh, specifically in that way. Great, would definitely encourage you all to, to continue engaging, get plugged in with Hands of Peace. Just wanted to say thank you all for joining us and for staying late. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I uh, want to also plug our the rest of this series of Peacemaking from Bottom to Top. Our next event is next Tuesday at 12 p.m. discussing with Almap um, founder and U.S. director, as well as um, the chief of staff to Representative Jeff Fortenberry, Andy Brainer, um, the work of Almap and also the recent passage of the Middle East Partnership for Peace Act. And I'm excited to announce also for the first time uh, on this call as well, part three of that series with former ambassador Martin Indyk discussing the geopolitics, diplomacy, peacemaking of the Biden administration. So you can find more information about those events on our website. Um, I would also just encourage you uh, to consider donating to Telos, partnering with us um, financially as we um, do this work and host these events for free. So consider that. I just wanted to say thank you again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed today's call and we hope to see you on future events soon. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye. Bye.